Hello, and welcome to Encounters with Polish Literature, brought to you by the Polish Cultural Institute in New York. I'm David Goldfarb, and I'll be your host. The Polish Parliament, or the same, has declared 2022 as the year of Polish Romanticism. So it is fitting that we happen to have Poland's most important Romantic poet, Adam Mickiewicz, who lived from 1798 to 1855, on the agenda for today. I like to think about Polish Romanticism in the context of European Romanticism more generally. Romanticism overlaps with and responds to Enlightenment rationalism in European culture. Enlightenment reason is contrasted by the Romantics with sentiment and emotion. Completeness, order, and symmetry are met with fragments and ruins. The incomplete and the infinite are realms of possibility in the form of what Edmund Burke and Immanuel Kant described as the sublime. Age gives way to youth. Neoclassicism is pushed aside by folklore and peasant culture. Science struggles with spiritualism. Images of nature stand in for the emotions in the form of pathetic fallacy, not in the sense of an error kind of fallacy caused by illusion, but of meaning conveyed precisely by illusion. Romantics all over Europe were inspired by the Byronic figure of the lonely outsider, who we can find in Mickiewicz and in Juliusz Słowacki, and again in the 20th century in the novels of Marek Kwasko, which we discussed in the ninth episode of Encounters with Polish Literature. Polish Romanticism places a special emphasis on the aesthetic value of improvisation, especially in music and poetry, and in descriptions of music in literary works. And that reflects the general European Romantic idea of organicism that the artistic work springs whole like a plant from the mind of the artist. Something unique about Poland's position in European Romanticism is that Poland and the Polish question in the time of the partitions was a romantic cause celebre itself outside of Poland, when Poland was subjugated by Russia, Prussia, and Austria toward the end of the 18th century and did not exist as an independent political state until after World War I. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the French philosopher who bridged the eras of the Enlightenment and Romanticism wrote a treatise on the government of Poland, characterizing Poland as a country defeated by Russia, but whose people were not defeated. He offers a very interesting description of justice in relation to the partitions that we'll see echoed later in our discussion of the opening lines of the Polish national epic, Pantadeusz. Rousseau writes, Justice, like good health, is a blessing that people enjoy without being aware of it, that inspires no enthusiasm, and that men learn to value only after they have lost it. Tadeusz Kościuszko, the Polish general who fought in the American Revolution and led an uprising against Russia and Prussia in 1794, was treated as a kind of real Byronic hero, appearing in poems by Keats, Coleridge, and even Byron in Don Juan, no less, and serving as a model for the hero of Miss Jane Porter's enormously popular historically novel, widely reprinted, largely forgotten today, Thaddeus of Warsaw. Czesław Miłosz, in his History of Polish Literature, echoes his predecessor, Manfred Kredel, with the assertion that Polish Romanticism begins with Mickiewicz's Ballads and Romances, published in 1822. We might look at Mickiewicz's poem Romantycznosť as a manifesto for Polish Romanticism. The American poet W.H. Auden translated Romanticznosť as the romantic in the sense of what romanticism consists of, rather than say a romantic as a person who ascribes to romanticism, though that could also apply to the female protagonist at the beginning of the poem and the speaker at the end of the poem. Auden didn't know Polish, so presumably he relied on native Polish speakers and or earlier translations to produce his own rather free translation that departs from the original syntax in rather significant ways and moves content around to fit a rhythmic feel and loose rhyme scheme, but tries to work naturally in English, following analogous ballad forms in the manner of the English romantics with whose work Mickiewicz was familiar. Despite the inaccuracies or pieces that don't match up in Auden's translation, Polish scholar Marta Skvara argues that to be translated by such a distinguished poet as Auden represents a literary success of sorts. And if we read every translation as an interpretation, we might 
paying attention to the original Polish text, see what comes through or is brought to the surface on Auden's particular rendition. Auden unfortunately omits the poem's epigraph from Hamlet. Methinks I see where in my mind's eyes. Mitskevich translates Shakespeare's minds as dusche, which could mean mind or soul, much like Geist in German. So we might say it takes on an expanded meaning in Mitskevich. It could also mean spirit or ghost. And indeed, the next thing that happens in Hamlet is that Shakespeare's protagonist meets his father's ghosts. We don't have time to read the whole work in this kind of detail, but the poem describes a girl who is staring into the night and encounters the spirit of her dead love, Yashenku, rendered as Johnny in Auden's translation, who was buried two years previously. She describes his pale skin resembling his white tunic, but implores him to press his lips to hers, even as she imagines how cold and damp it must be in the grave. Auden's translation comes into focus in the concluding stanzas of the poem, following the form more closely, paraphrasing the language, though. The girl is out of her senses, shouts a man with a learned air. My eye and my lenses know there's nothing there. Ghosts are a myth of alewife and blacksmith. Clodhoppers, this is treason against King Reason. Yet the girl loves, I reply diffidently, and the people believe reverently. Faith and love are more discerning than lenses or learning. You know the dead truths, not the living, the world of things, not the world of loving. Where does any miracle start? Cold eye, look in your heart. In these last four stanzas, the learned man is Jan Szniadecki, a Polish mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher who expressed his skepticism about ghosts and spiritualism in language rather similar to Mickiewicz's in the third stanza from, uh, from the end. In an essay published in 1819 in the Jennik Wilenski or the Vilno Daily, feeling and faith, paraphrased by Auden as faith and love, speak more strongly to the poem's speaker than lenses or learning. Chnyadetsky's scientific truths are dead, while sentiment is living. While the Enlightenment mind is interested in the externally observable scientific truth, the Romantic is interested in the phenomenological internal truth as it appears in the mind. Now, before we meet today's guest, I'd like to thank everyone who has been following along with encounters with Polish literature as we continue into our second year and have begun to plan our third year of programming. If you like what you hear on this program, click the thumbs up down below. Ring the bell to get notifications about new episodes Follow the playlist of all our episodes in the description of the program. Leave a comment if you can. And please click the subscribe button to show the Polish Cultural Institute New York that you are interested and would like to hear more about Polish literature, its past and present, here on Encounters with Polish Literature. Roman Koropetsky is a professor in the Department of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Languages and Cultures at the University of California, Los Angeles. UCLA, where he's been teaching since 1992. He received his BA in Comparative Literature at Columbia University in 1976 and his PhD in Slavic Language and Literatures at Harvard University in 1990. Koropetsky is the author of two award-winning books on Adam Mickiewicz, The Poetics of Revitalization, Adam Mickiewicz Between Forefathers Eve Part Three and Pan Tadeusz in 2001, and Adam Mickiewicz, The Life of a Romantic, 2008, translated into Polish in 2013, as well as many articles on Polish, Ukrainian, and Little Russian literatures. He is currently at work on a study about the life of the 18th century Ukrainian bandit, Simeon Harkusha, and the stories about him. Welcome to the program, Roman. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here today. Great seeing you. Um, so, how did you get involved in writing about Mitskevich's biography? What, what drew you to this topic? Well, I mean, I guess it began with the fact that my dissertation was about biographies of Mitskevich. Uh, so that kind of uh, set me up in terms of gathering a good portion of the material for it. Uh, then I had the book that I wrote for uh, my uh, tenure 
was something completely different. It was about uh, Mitzkevich trying to link together uh, Forefathers Eve Part Three and Panta Deus. That was so. That was my first book, and then I was thinking to myself, "What's going to be my next project?" So I was out for a few drinks with my scientific buddies, all of whom, none of whom knew who Mitzkevich was or anything like that, and uh, they asked me. Uh, what I had written, uh, you know, the, the the book that I had just written about uh, Miskevich, and uh, one of the and I was saying, well, I don't know what to do next. And one of the guys just said, well, Why don't you write a biography of Miskevich? Nobody knows anything about him. So I said to myself, Wow, what a br brilliant idea! <laughs> and uh, I must say, I think on my part, it was a bit audacious to have done that, uh, to have decided to do that. Uh, to, but then I thought to myself, well, you know, I mean, there hadn't been a biography of Miskevich since 1911. It would be something very different for writing for an English speaking audience than it would be for a Polish audience, obviously, where uh, works on Miskevich, where, you know, the, the audience is saturated, right, with uh, secondary material on Miskevich. Biographies included, although not so much, interestingly enough. Uh, so essentially, that was. Uh, how I came about doing it. And I guess the, the nice part about it was one of the way, one of the, I, I read a, up to several books about writing biographies before launching into this. And uh, one of them, I think is called Footsteps, I think it was called. And uh, the notion, it struck me that one of the good points about writing this biography is going to be able to go travel to all of the places that Miskevich uh, went to as long as I can get the money for it. And I was lucky enough to get uh, several grants uh, to do that. So went to uh, two big trips, one to Eastern Europe, to Lithuania, Belarus, Turkey, Ukraine, to Crimea at that time, or I could still travel <laughs> uh, to Crimea. And then the next trip was to uh, Western Europe, going to you know Italy, Switzerland, all those places. So that was a real uh, uh, extra added attraction of writing the biography. There really was, before this came out, nothing contemporary in the way of a biography of Mitskevich. So, it, you, know, I, you know, I used to teach, you know, a course on romanticism. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, I would teach Mitskevich if I was teaching you know, Polish romanticism. But, um, but we really didn't. Yeah, I mean, we had to, you know, sort of I, we could our students who could read Polish could obviously read this material in Polish. But uh, we didn't have anything to bring anybody into it. So so it's a very important book in that uh, in that way. And, you know, thinking of Mitskevich as sort of the the major poet of the 19th century. I mean, can you imagine if like, you know, and, you know, if, if, you know, in German, they didn't have a biography of Goethe and, and if in English, we didn't have a biography of Wordsworth, right? I mean, there, there would be, you know, it would be tough to teach that material. So uh, it's really, you know, an important thing that you've done, I think, to, to, Thank uh, you. to, yeah. to write this. I um, should point out though, uh, uh, just very quickly, that there were shorter work, uh, sh shorter entries, if you will, really, because that's in fact what they were on Miscavige. One very, very good one, I think for some sort of uh, a world writer series that Weintraub had written that was very good. It was kind of pendant to his book on the poetry of Adam Miscavige. Uh -huh. uh, so there were shorter pieces on, Mis uh, on Miscavige that were available in English, but nothing, of course, you know, a biography length type thing that I had written. No, I mean, I, was there, was there like, did David Welsh write a, a Twain's World Author series or something Yes, like but that? that's a, that's largely a critical, that's a critical a, a, a work, review, yeah. Critical, a, a, largely an overview of his literature, of, of his work, which is something I do not do in my biography. I set out very purposely not to deal with uh, to not to make it a critical biography, but just a pure biography, because my interest in him was more uh, as a person. Which is, you know, there is so much there. I mean, uh, and, you know, eventually somebody will write the critical biography. Um, but, you know, I mean, we need more of the works really available in modern translations. We have a few so far. Um, That's the point. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, one of the more interesting points I thought, you know, in your in your Mitskevich biography, um, which I have I have right here, uh, I actually own two copies of this because I reviewed it for this Armation review. I can say you the Polish translation if you don't have that one. I don't have that one. No, oh, I have, I have extra copies of that. I'll be more than happy to send you one. <laughs> I'd love to. Has it been updated? It, it's been corrected. 
Correct. And okay. partially revised. Uh, so in a se- and the translation is superb. It's really, really good. I mean, the, uh, Ms. Glazenop really did a really fine job in the translation. Uh, but the important thing is, there's a lot of these little devils, these little imps that I found in the <laughs> English edition have been correct, corrected as a result of having to go over everything in translation. So uh, there's that positive side of that. That's yeah, that's not that's true of many biographies I found of, you know, people like there there's a biography in Malinowski, you know, for instance, where the the uh, the Polish version uh, corrects many, uh, you know, minor, minor issues mm-hmm. in the uh, in the English version. Um, but anyway, well, one of the sort of more interesting points I thought uh, was uh, in the biography was um you talk a lot about how Mitskevich was um, a major European intellectual in his own day. I mean, we've we've kind of lost touch with that, I think. Um, uh, but uh, but among his peers, uh, he was. So h- how did that happen? I mean, who was he in contact with? How quickly was he translated uh, into uh, languages other than Polish? Um, and, and then how did it change? Well, uh the big turning point in, uh, paradoxically, uh, in Mitskevich's life was his arrest in uh, 1824 and then having to be politically exiled to uh, Russia. Well, let's say away from Pol- native Polish lands, Polish Lithuanian lands to Russia. And as we all know, the exile wasn't uh, the worst things. Some of his colleagues had it much worse. Thomas Thomas Zahn, for instance, was sent out to uh, 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 Western Siberia, for instance. But Miskevich and uh, his friend Franciszek Maletsky uh, were sent to Odessa, uh, not a bad place to be at that time, and then spent time in Moscow and in Saint Petersburg. And as a result, well, not as a result. Because of his remarkable charisma, because of his intelligence, uh, because of his talent with people, because of his presence, he made friends with some of the most important uh, cultural figures of Russia at the time. Uh, This being the 1820s, the most important cultural figures of the time were all part of the Russian elite, people like uh, Prince Vyazimsky, for instance, uh, or uh, Zidina Volkonskaya. Uh, and as thanks to them, he managed to get an in, once he left Russia, into the cultural elite of Western Europe, in Italy, in Switzerland, and so forth. But again, on the uh, strength of his own charisma, and this is something that Odinitz, his, uh, um, uh, his sidekick, his uh, Eckerman, Eckerman, if you want, uh, notes in his uh, letters from a journey in which he traces his travels with uh, Mitskevich through Italy and uh, western parts of Western Europe is his personal description of what charisma is. It's this something that he had that is in- impossible to put into words to actually describe. And I think that played a very, very important role in um, uh, in uh, uh, ensuring Mitskevich's presence in the, among the cultural elites of uh, Western Europe. Uh, so that's his personal uh, presence. As far as translations are concerned, translations of his work began first and foremost into Russian. And as soon as the Crimean sonnets came out, There must have been, I think there were like about five or six translations that came out almost immediately, within a year or two years. And then French and German translations of them began coming out as well. Although there there had been earlier German translations of a number of his ballads as well, but they were in a a provincial Lemberg, Lviv, Lvuf journal uh, that I don't think had too much. I don't think even Goethe had seen them. So um, that's essentially the way his poetry uh, uh, came onto the scene in uh, at, at that point in his uh, at that point in his career. For a person who's considered like the national poet, he didn't really spend very much time in Poland, did he? Well, if we look at the boundaries of contemporary Poland, he spent no time in Poland except for the two years 
af between um, uh, uh, the, the two years in uh, Western Poland in, uh, in, in the Poznań region when he tried to make his way <laughs> half-heartedly to join the uprising, which I don't think he was particularly, he particularly wanted to. I think he was relatively happy not to have joined that. But that was it. Those two years, or one and a half years even, I think, in the Poznań region, and that was the only time he's ever been in what is now Poland proper. He always considered himself a Polish-Lithuanian, uh, and uh, the people he hung out in, in when, he, when he emigrated to Paris were primarily from the eastern regions, primarily from uh, Poland, Polish Lithuania. Uh, he had conflicts with people from the Congress Kingdom, uh, with other people, with conflict with people from other parts of Poland. There's these. We, we, <laughs> when I was writing the biography, I realized that at that time Poland was still really a relatively fragmented, and it wasn't that long after the final partitions, but it was really regionally quite fragmented, and they were quite. There are tensions between the various regions, between those who came from Ukraine, those who came from Lithuania, those who came from the Congress Kingdom, uh, those who came from the uh, uh, from the Poznań lands. That's yeah, that that's that's an interesting perspective. I mean, you know, I mean, of course, we all know that Poland didn't exist as a political country at that time as a political state, um, because it had been partitioned, you know, between the, the Russians, the Austrians and the Prussians. Um, but, uh, but in a, in a sense, maybe they were really exploiting uh, regional conflict, um, you know, in a way that, you know, I had I hadn't really thought about before, but but uh, but that's something of what's going on. And something that Mitskevich's uh, life uh, reveals. Um, so well, the uh, opening lines of Pantadeusz, after all, right? Uh, right. Lithuania. <laughs> and it's, you know, and it's something that we could see in, you know, in, in contemporary writers too. Of course, Miłosz was from that region. Konvitsky is from that region. Um, and uh, it's, it's its own specific identity. Absolutely. Uh, um, so wh why do we look at, you know, at the Crimean sonnets, which are, you know, one of the, I think probably the most recent uh, interesting translation of, uh, of Mitskevich is the, appears in uh, the, in the latest issue, I think, of the journal Cardinal Points mm -hmm. um, uh, by, uh, by Kevin Kearney. Um, and, and you've written about this, uh, about the Crimean sonnets in a, in a recent essay as well, right, in the, uh, in the literary encyclopedia? Mm -hmm. which is, which is, uh, is that a, an entirely online publication? It's literary? entirely yes. online. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So people can, uh, who have access to a university. Right. Library, Your uh, library has to have a subscription to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so where do you, where do you want to, well, first of all, what's the background to the poems? He was writing these when in the 1820s, right? Okay. Um, in, uh, during his exile in Odessa, in uh, 1825, uh, he took a trip uh, to the Crimea together with um, a, his lover, Karolina Sobańska, whose sister was the lover of Balzac, uh, with her other lover, who was the uh, uh, Vit, who was the kind of the Russian prefect for the southern region, uh, with a entomologist who was actually a czarist spy and also very interestingly with Henrik Zhivuski uh, who was going to become one of the probably the during the romantic period probably the best prose writer during the romantic period. Sobinsky, Sobinsky's brother. Sobinsky's, bro Sobinsky's brother exactly yeah, right. right. He took a trip around the Crimea for uh, several weeks and uh, the Crimean sonnets are a product of this uh, trip. Uh, both the trip there, the ocean voyage to the Crimea, and then the world of uh, Russo-Tatar Crimea, which is reflected in the sonnets themselves in a very strange way, in a lot of ways. Uh, we don't really see contemporary Crimea. What we, we don't see their, the Tatar inhabitants of uh, Crimea. We don't see the Russian inhabitants of Crimea. What we see is a romantic, orientalized Crimea. This really is Miscavige's uh, a, a programmatic exercise in byrono gutian Disasian Orientalism. 
I mean, really, in some places, even over the top. <laughs> uh, so it, it's interesting that I mean, uh, yeah, I think the contemporary you know critique of uh, of Orientalism that we get from Said and so forth. I mean, ties you know this the the Oriental discourse, the Orientalist discourse in the nineteenth century to um, to colonialist projects. Um, to uh, political objectives that maybe you know that Byron didn't necessarily adhere to personally, but that uh, that fit a kind of you know a kind of uh, political discourse that was prevalent at the time. Whereas Poland doesn't have those kinds of Oriental colonial interests, right? I mean, that that's... Well, there's two ways of looking at that. Recently, there's been quite a bit of uh, uh, critical literature on the relationship of Poland to its own eastern borderlands and the orientalist, colonialist attitude towards uh, the Ukrainian, Belarusian, Lithuanian right. lands. That's a different story. In this case, and I had written an essay about this a lot earlier, for siege, in, and it was kind of controversial, in which I would argue, and again, as you point out with Byron, whether this is conscious or not, but what we're talking about is a Westerner's, a Westerner of the first half of the 19th century, and they're contributing to or caught up in the discourse of that time. And the discourse of that time towards the Orient was of a particular way. I mean, that was, I mean, we can critique it now. We can say it was colonialist and so forth. But this is just the way people looked, Western Europeans or Europeans looked at the Orient. And certainly, I think some of the attitudes or sorry, some of the positions of uh, Mitskevich, uh, the perspectives of Mitskevich, in um, uh, Crimean sonnets are, are reflections of that discourse. And my argument was that Volens Nolens, what Miskevich was doing was in a sense uh, validating or contributing to the Russian discourse, Russian colonialist discourse of the Crimea. And uh, which is why I point out both in my earlier essay and in this one for the literary encyclopedia, why Vyazimsky was so enthusiastic about the Crimean sonnets because, oh, look at this, Poles and Russians finally have found a point of agreement in that they can look at this particular place, they can other this place, they can orientalize uh, the Crimea, which of course now at this point is part of the, uh, uh, a new gem or new jewel in the, uh, uh, in the Russian colonial crown, just as Poland was more recently. On the other hand, we can also say that there is a sense in the Crimean sonnets, particularly in those two, the, the three sonnets, a sequence about uh, the uh, Khan's palace and Bakhchisarai, where we sense on Mitskevich's part a sympathy, perhaps, or a empathy, maybe that's a better way of putting it, empathy towards the, um, at least, the vestiges of the Crimean world, the Tatar world that is no longer there, uh, that may have been destroyed by the Russian colonialist. But on the third hand, as <laughs> Omelan Pritsak used to like to say, we also have the feeling that Mitskevich is projecting this notion, particularly in his relationship with his Tatar guide, that uh, Thanks to the Russians, thanks to the Westerners, the Crimea has been brought up, enlightened, in a typical colonialist discourse in this respect. So it's it's a complex issue. It's not it's not black and white. Yeah, I, I what's interesting to me is that to participate in you know in in modern Western culture that's you engage in that discourse, right? I mean, that that's uh, even, even if, even if Poland has no, Poland is itself a colony, right? I mean, right. Uh, at that, at that time, especially right. More than anything else. So the thinking about, you know, him, the relationship between him and his guide, may, maybe we should, we should look at these. Um, uh, we talked about uh, discussing the, the view of the mountains from the, the cause uh -huh. step, uh, which I think is, you know, it's, it's as good a way in as, as any um, in the, in the, in the time we, have. The sun is called the view of the mountains from the Kozlov steppe, and it was originally called the pilgrim because it's the first, this is the first sonnet where he actually introduces the figure of the pilgrim, uh, uh, who sometimes speaks, who imitates uh, his Tatar guide, uh, who absorbs 
who learns from the Tatar guide, but at the same time, um, whom the Tatar guide, in a sense, orientalizes. Uh, so the pilgrim is the first one speaking, and it's um, a um, uh, didiscalia. So in other words, it's not part of the poem. Up there, did Allah fashion the ice sea expanse? Was this throne carved for angels out of frozen falls? And from one fourth the globe, did devis erect these walls to stop the march of stars from Eastern provenance? It glows, is Istanbul a flame in radiance above? Or did Allah once night spread dun gray palls like hillots across the sky? ignite the starry halls of heaven to alight the world in luminance. And then the Mirza speaks. There, I have been up there where winter reigns, the beaks of brooks and throats of streams drank from its dress nest of ice. And where I walked, my breath fell to the ground as snow. No eagle ventured to these heights. I gazed from peaks at clouds below where thunder rolled down the precipice of night and overhead a single star did glow. That's Chatterdach. And then the pilgrim goes, ah. Those last two lines are a little outside the, the form of the, the Petrarchan sonnet that he's following most of the time. Absolutely. It's, a, it's, it's almost literally like a precipice, right? It yes. really, it visually, it shows the heights of uh, the mountain bear. I think it's a very, a really very nice deft move. Although uh, in his, in one of his letters, Mitzkevich described this, ah, to put it orientally, upon hearing his words, the pilgrim put a finger of surprise in his mouth. The guide is very much a romantic vision of, of, of the Orient, right? I mean, here, the pilgrim is like Byron's, like the Jower, you know, uh, who is some mysterious wanderer with a shady past or something like that. And, uh, and the, the 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 guide is this um, you know all knowing you know person of, of 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 eternal wisdom or something like that and and it, it works in a very complex way too through in the course of the sonnets because the what the pilgrim does in a formal way what the pilgrim does as you know he speaks in this rather hyper and it could is Sinkowski. Uh, the very famous Polish turncoat, right, uh, who was a, uh, one of the best Orientalists at that time uh, in St. Petersburg, um, who Mickiewicz knew, he had met him uh, even before he went to uh, the Crimea and then afterwards. Uh, Sienkowski critiqued Mickiewicz for this language. He said, nobody speaks like this, you know, uh, uh, Eastern poetry is not written like this and so forth and so on. So Mickiewicz, of course, is exaggerating this Orientalist discourse, this Orientalist poetics. Uh, but what we see here is that as the, the, the Mirza, his guide, speaks in these, um, in this Orientalist diction, this Orientalist uh, rhetoric, the uh, Pilgrim, and then Mitskevich himself begins to absorb this in the course of uh, the uh, cycle until, uh, and I'll quote one, one more thing, until he begins to speak in his own voice and the poem Alushta at Night, where he says, the breeze feels brisk, the arid winds of day abate, the back of Chatter glows and the parting beams which spill and crash and crimson like celestial streams, then fade, the pilgrim listens in a watchful state. And then at the end it finishes, O Eastern night, like Odalisk of Orient, your caresses soothe the slumber, yet dare I recline to sleep, you rouse again with sparkling eyes alight. Where Mitskevich begins to assume the poet Mitskevich begins to assume the discourse, the rhetoric, or this Oriental rhetoric in the way the pilgrim, uh, in the way the Mirza speaks. Uh, so it's a very interesting kind of formal device that occurs, or a formal shift that occurs throughout the uh, cycle. It's it's a journey to becoming a poet, I suppose. Right, I mean, of course. On uh, the final poem, the final uh, sonnet, Ayuda, is certainly uh, an you know clear expression of that. And here I am, the great poet, the Orient made me this in a sense. Uh, so it, this is the way he pays homage to uh, what he had just experienced. Maybe I'll read that one so we can, ha we can have Okay, them. yeah, we go can, ahead. Look at both of them. So, Ayuda, 
Uh, resting on cliffs of Ayuda, I like to gaze at foaming breakers in the surf. These waves in black battalions burst like snow upon the jagged stack of rocks with myriad rainbows wheeling in the haze. The waves make turgid motion crashing in the bays like troops of whales along the shore in crazed attack to claim the land in triumph, then receding back with mussels, pearls, and corals glittering in sun's rays. And this is what it looks like, poet, in your heart. Your passions brew foul weather, yet you grab your lyre and find no inner turbulence can harm you now. As pain sinks to oblivion, an eternal art of songs in verse emerge as crown from tempering fire with which the future ages will adorn your brow. That's the poet uh, arriving, right? And, and also it says, you know, and this is what it looks like poet in your heart, right? I mean, the, on the, it's the, it, this is, this is, you know, the, he starts out and he's looking at the mountains and this is, you know, what we call pathetic fallacy, um, that the emotions are reflected in the, uh, in the image of the, uh, uh, of the landscape. And it's, a, you know, and it's also about what he's searching for, right? I mean, he's, he's putting himself in the, in the landscape to find himself. You know, that, that's the romantic searcher looking, looking for self-actualization. <laughs> And one very, very important aspect of this, and again, uh, uh, I write about this in the uh, encyclopedia entry, is that this is Miscavige's first experience of the sublime in nature. Uh, first, he experiences the sublime um, uh, of, of, of the ocean storm, for instance, or both of the ocean both the ocean calm and the ocean storm. Then he experiences the sublime of the heights of the mountains and the cliffs and the precipices. And then he experiences the sublime of history and of, 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 of the transience of history in the, in, in the, um, uh, in the palace of Bakshi Serai. So all of these are different aspects of his experience of the sublime, something, by the way, he talks about in his lectures later on. He's really, I mean, Miskevich was an extraordinarily well-read young poet. And he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, and in this case, he's clearly <laughs> putting to work his readings of, of the various theories of the sublime that he had read from the Germans. And uh, it's, it's quite evident here. Uh, do we do we do we know what he I mean, I think he, he mentions Kant explicitly at some point. And he mentions Burke uh, uh, explicitly in the uh, lectures where he says that it is that the sublime is is terrible fear, I, 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 delicious fear. Something that I'm interested in now in writing about Miskevich is that Miskevich was very well aware of what he was doing when he wrote the Crimean Sonnets. Uh, he consciously, I think, went, as we kind of we were talking about this before, he consciously went out and, program, and to, to write a programmatically orientalist work. And when it came to suggestions about what works of his to translate, at this time, and then a few years later, uh, he said, really, the one thing that will definitely appeal to, and this is interesting, to foreigners, to Westerners, are going to be the Crimean signs. Uh, and also Konrad Wallenrod. Why? Because of its Byronic nature. So Miskevich was well, very well aware of the um, uh, uh, horizon of expectations among Western readers and what he's producing. On the one hand, on the other hand, He's programmatically producing an Orientalist work. And as you mentioned, something that for Poles is really, you know, who cares about the Orient in, in the first half of 19th century in Poland, right? Uh, the Crimea, you know, Turkey. Later on, Turkey is going to be important, obviously. But at this time, you know, no, 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 Orientalism is not part of Polish literary discourse. So, uh, what well, there's Sarmatianism, right? I mean, uh, right. But that's but that's different. That's right? different. From yeah. That this is, you know, 17th, 18th centuries. So this is, we're dealing here with romantic Orientalism. Yeah. And uh, what Miskevich is very consciously doing is that on the one hand, he's aware of the, of the foreign horizon of expectations and what he's writing for, but at the same time, he's trying to push Polish literature into that to make it part of this larger discourse of romanticism that's been now really you know, part of everyday discourse in Germany and England and beginning to be in France as well as in Italy. Let's look at, at, at Pantadeusz, uh, the, the, the Polish national poem. Polish national poem 
is about essentially about a feud between two uh, families. And as all feuds go, it has a backstory, and the backstory is about a, um, um, a mesalliance uh, between a uh, rich, uh, a, a rich girl woman and a poor uh, nobleman who's also a troublemaker. And this uh, poor gentryman uh, happens to shoot the father of this girl just as the Russians are attacking his castle. And he is accused of being a, uh, a collaborationist with the Russians at this time. So in order to repent, he becomes a monk. He takes on the name of uh, the worm, right? The fa father of the worm. Uh, he joins Robak. Robak, right? He participates in all kinds of uh, Polish patriotic emigre activities. And then he comes back. He saves the last heir of that other feuding families. And this occurs during a feud when they, the, the two families, uh, two groups of uh, uh, the two feuding groups fight. And he sacrifices his life uh, to save the last to save the last heir of the other family. And on a, on a, in, in, a in a bed in a, uh, a deathbed confession, he tells his whole story. And through this story, what he does is he brings the society of old Poland into a new one where they, these feuding groups join together against a common enemy, in this case, the Russians, and then join up with, the, with Napoleon's uh, legions. And in joining up with Napoleon's legions, they enter history. They move the old Poland back aside the last vestiges of old Poland and enter into the modern world. So these two families are the Soplitsas and the Horeshkos. Um, and uh, and the, uh, the Horeshkos are the ones that have only one heir uh, remaining and it was their castle. Um, uh, what I'm, uh, and, and it's also like, I, I mean, I think what people love about, you know, Pantadeus in Polish. I mean, Pantadeus wasn't popular in, in Mickiewicz's day, right? Even Mickiewicz didn't like it, I think, right? I mean... Uh, he said he should have spent more time trying to finish up Forefathers Eve Part 3 <laughs> rather than spending time writing uh, Pantadeus, although he wrote Pantadeus very quickly, which, you know, just like a lot of his other stuff he wrote very quickly, remarkably quickly. Um, yeah, and it, I, I think people love like the set pieces in, you know, in Pantadeus. They love, uh, they love the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the scene of mushroom hunting, which has nothing, not, it, it has some things to do with the plot because the, you know, the, the love interest is developing there. But it's, it's mostly, you know, the, the, the epic litany of naming the mushrooms and, and things like that. Or, you know, the, the scene of the wedding banquet and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the plate uh, at the the centerpiece that is you know kind of like the uh, very domesticated version of the shield of uh, the the shield of Achilles a uh, kind of ekphrasis that's um, that's uh, but 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 nothing heroic at all uh, there's you know the the you know one of my favorite scenes is the bigos I, I once gave a talk about uh, about the bigos um, which uh, becomes a, a symbol for uh, Poland itself attacked on three sides by people with swords uh <laughs> i mean it's over the top but it's but it's but it's you know it's it's very you know it's, it's wonderful and uh and of course uh, at the end uh uh the uh uh, the uh, Jewish dulcimer player Yankiel playing the, uh, the the Polonaise. I mean, these are all all scenes that that people um, that that you know that that Poles in, enjoy thinking about uh, apart from the plot. I mean, they're they're almost uh, standalone uh, standalone pieces. Um, but um, some of the things I you know I, I was thinking on this reading were that um, you know. You know, what do you make of the figure of the count? I mean, on the one hand, the count is like he's like positioned as a romantic, but he's it's kind of there's there's a, he's like also a, a an object of satire, right? I mean, he's kind oh, of oh, absolutely, 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 of course, he's an object of satire, and it, it's a, it, it, it's it's satire with a very very light touch. It's uh, uh, I guess you know the 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 uh, uh, best example, the embodiment of the satirical mode here is the very closing lines of uh, Pantadeusz, 
uh, when uh, he says, uh, and I drank mead and wine among them there, and what I saw and heard recorded here, right? Uh, so in other words, is there's this little ironic smile that Mitzkevich has throughout. And this is what, by the way, one of the things that people during his lifetime critiqued about Pantadeus. Uh, everybody was expecting some kind of heroic epic, right? Uh, in the uh, neoclassical mode, if you will, right? Uh, about, you know, Poland's struggle for independence. Remember, this was written in 1834 after the 1830 uprising. Uh, so people were really quite disappointed. People felt that he was making fun of old Poland, uh, that he was making fun of some of the characters here, that he wasn't taking seriously. Słowacki calls it a, a pig-like, that it smells of, of, of various uh, 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 rural things, that it, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't uh, approach the sublime, something that we would expect from an epic. Uh, and indeed, like you said, it took a while for this to sink in and become Poland's national epic. And the reason it did was because, like many epics, it's an encyclopedia of a way of life that is no longer there. And it's an encyclopedia of a way of life that, and this is hard to say, whether it's because of Pantadeusz or whether it simply resonates with Polish culture, in other words, gentry culture. And I think we all know that gentry culture is the hegemonic culture of Poland. Uh, the, you know, the peasant has always been there, but he, the peasant does not put a mark on Polish culture. And uh, it's the gentry, particularly the middling gentry that is re represented in, in Panta Deusz, that really gave shape uh, to Polish culture. Uh, and this is what was recognized after 1863 when Panta Deusz really becomes, thanks to the, with, with the reception of Panta Deusz, makes it into, in many ways, into a uh, Poland's national epic. Although there's no doubt about the fact that Miskevich set out to write an epic. I mean, what we have, the, the fact that he wrote this in uh, 13 syllabic uh, uh, a, a, a 13 syllabic line immediately signals to us this is epic meter, right? Uh, so said the seven plus six. Uh, so there's no yeah, question. The Polish Alexandrian. Is right, story. exactly. There's no question that Miskevich set out to write an epic. Perhaps the most, uh, you know, well-known uh, lines or the opening lines um, that, uh, you know, that it opens up with this, this apostrophe to Lithuania. Which uh, you know we could you know we could read you know the first the oh first, yes by the, all the means if, if 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 you'd like to this Bill Johnson's translation which yeah, by is, the way there have been several translations and this is by far the best this is really a wonderful translation I think very successful it's a it's a relatively new one it's uh, it's uh, he he mentions that he avoids uh, archaism which is true um, mm -hmm. that uh, that he wants it to sound natural uh, exactly. not not strangely modern um, but uh, but something that could fit in any period um, that it's it has exactly a certain right. kind of mm -hmm. ne neutrality I mean and it starts Lithuania my homeland you are health alone your worth can only ever be known be known by one who's lost you that's one of those andramments that, exactly, that makes the right. line feel feel unstable even if it perhaps isn't, uh, which is exactly how it is in Polish. I mean, it's line right. for, it, it matches up line for line. Absolutely. Um, that, that he doesn't add like sections or, or, or things like that to make it, to make it work out. I mean, I guess you could say that the first line, uh, you are health alone, the alone isn't necessarily, you know, in the, in the Polish, but, um, and he's doing it to make it rhyme with one. And I'm sure he must have liked to, Translate the opening lines of Panta Deus. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's a huge challenge, right? I mean, what do you yes, because it's it's something so well known in Polish um, uh, that uh, that uh, you know he knows that everybody's going to like open it up and say, "All right, read these first four lines." Um, so, um, who's lost you? Today I see and tell anew your lovely beauty as I long for you. And that's perfectly natural. I mean, that, that, that works. I guess what it does is it joins um, this, this sense of, you know, the, you know, the, the epic past, you know, this uh, sort of the troubled present and the possible future, right? I mean, that that's, uh, that that's you know, 
what this this form that somehow between you know that seems to me between uh, between epic and novel uh, does that it's uh, it's about things that you know unfold in everyday life. It's not uh, necessarily so heroic. Um, they're you know they're not uh, you know they're not too many major figures except for uh, for Dombrowski at the end maybe. But uh, right. but, uh, but who's who's not necessarily doing anything terribly heroic? No. In, he's sitting at a fe- he's sitting in a feast. You know, <laughs> you mean his general. Generals, essentially. But, you know, the, the thing is like this. There's, there's several things. Remember, we have to remember that um, uh, at least according to what we know from his correspondence, uh, uh, the poem was originally meant to be some sort of version of Goethe's uh, Hermann and Dorothea, which means it was a kind of an epic <coughs> idol. OK. And then clearly Sir Walter Scott had a hand in uh, shaping uh, uh, what Pantadeus looks like. And of course, it has all of the usual features of a Scottian novel insofar as we had a feuding, clan, feuding clans, we have a nondescript hero who's caught up in historical events at the end. So we have all of this, you know, a typical Scottian uh, romance here, uh, or Scottian novel, I should say. So from that point of view, what we were saying, the, the other very important thing is, I think what you were saying was in terms of its uh, chronology, if you will, uh, that here we have a, a past that's depicted, a past that is really in the past. It no longer exists. This, is this old Poland that Mitskevich still remembers from his childhood and his memory is remarkable, you know, that he could remember all of these details. It's just mind boggling. And then we have this troubled present, as you say, uh, of... Uh, Poland threatened by Russia, uh, although <laughs> the Russian enemy here uh, turns out to be, well, on the one hand, they execute one of the Russians, and then the other one turns out to be a kind of a friend of the Poles, right? He said, I will let bygones be bygones, which is also you know, a reflection of Mitskevich's own attitude towards Russians, uh, which was very, very complex in many ways, extremely complex and very controversial, uh, but that's a different story. But what's, I think, most interesting is this future that you spoke about, because one can't really speak about a future in Panda Deus, what really one can speak about is a subjunctive, uh, that this is what may be like, what would be nice to have and so forth. And of course, everybody pointed out there, Pantadeus is concerned with seasons, but there's one season that doesn't exist here and that's winter. Okay? Uh, we have spring, we have summer, we have fall, uh, but no winter. So I say, I think uh, using the word subjunctive here is I think is a very, it's a very, I think descriptive way of saying what Pantadeus is looking forward to, uh, and uh, the belief Miskevich had that perhaps Poland is becoming a modern nation finally, uh, a nation in the Herderian sense, and this is why I think that Pantadeus truly is a national epic in a modern sense. Is that it does show the um, the forging of a modern nation, of a modern national consciousness. Uh, I, I Miskevich is very careful. Remember earlier we were talking about the regionalism of er, early 19th century Poland. Well, in Pantadeus, he's very careful about bringing all of Poland into this little area in Lithuania, making it a little microcosm of what well, we have people from Poznań, we have people from the Congress Kingdom here, we have everybody somehow, uh, uh, all of them collaborating and communicating and cooperating to help forge this new non-regional, to help forge this new modern nation of Poland in the Herderian sense, of course. Um, so uh, in this sense, I think that um, um, we can talk about uh, Panta Deus as one of these, perhaps the only example of a modern day of a modern day epic uh, in the very much in the Homerian, Homeric, or even uh, or even more so the Virgilian sense of the word. One thing that's 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 interesting about uh, about Mitskevich is he's been in the news recently, right? I mean that we were talking a little bit about uh, about uh, Jade uh, for Father's Eve, um, part three. And- Part three, um, and of course there are. Maybe we should explain. There are four parts. Uh, he wrote parts two and part of part four. Uh, two, two, two and four, then one that was published posthumously, and then three after he wrote two and four. 
in which the the character undergoes a, a trans the main character undergoes a transformation from Gustav to uh, to Conrad. And part three is always the the, the controversial one in 1968. It was the uh, the subject of uh, of uh, political upheaval. So the play, you know, the 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 title, the the Forefathers Eve, comes from a, a Baltic uh, folk ritual. Um, that uh, I mean, as drama, it's maybe not too atypical of the uh, of the uh, Romantic era to you know to write some drama that's like far too long and impossible to put on stage, you know, like Goethe's Faust, uh, which I, I, has been staged, but it's uh, almost all the stagings of, of Jada or of a part of it or of some, some segment that, you know, that can be made to work on stage. Of course, the fragment isn't necessarily an accident because the fragment is part of romanticism, that, uh, that uh, some fragments are intentional and some less so. Um, it's uh, it, it you know it becomes the the subject of political upheaval in 1968 in uh, Kajimia's uh, Demex uh, Dame production, right? Uh, which uh, of course in this is the communist era, so uh, there's uh, a lot of anti-Tsarist uh, uh, discourse in uh, in uh, especially in part three. Um, and uh, and uh, of course the uh, the poles don't want to uh, offend the Soviet Union, so uh, so they try to you know put or they do effectively you know put a stop to this. Um, and then we have another another controversy just in the last few months, really, um, of the uh, a production that celebrates, uh, it was put on to celebrate the, uh, the 120th anniversary of, the, uh, of uh, Stanisław Wispiański's production in Kraków, um, right. in the Słowacki Theater. Um, right. And uh, in the style of contemporary Polish theater, um, it, uh, it's, uh, it's very avant-garde. Um, there's a, uh, Conrad is played by a, by a female actress, um, More than just a female actress, a disabled female actress. Well, she's not the, the actress isn't disabled, but the character is disabled. To you know, incorporate all kinds of um, uh, social issues, which you know, I mean, and it's it's it it shows the flexibility of the work to uh, to uh, rise to all sorts of uh, sorts of you know. Uh, agendas or or uh, or uh, or interests let's say um and uh, in response to this the uh, the uh, the superintendent of uh, of education um in the uh, Krakow region uh, sort of said well we can't send you know let children go to see this uh, of course this had an immediate streisand effect of selling out all shows uh, <laughs> and, and and the uh, uh and of course the uh, the minister of education who is from the uh, what's usually translated into English as the Law and Justice Party. Um, Populists. The the populist, the current populist party, also you know agreed with uh, agreed with the um, uh, the, uh, the 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 education superintendent, uh, and uh, and uh, it shows how Mitskevich is very much you know uh, um, uh, in the in the contemporary discourse. It's not just like some dusty old uh, dusty old romantic poetry or something from the 19th century. It's something that's sure. actually very current in Poland. You see, it, it's a little, it's, it's, it's complex here because um, up till now, uh, Forefathers Eve, part, of course, you know, we were discussing about this earlier, that Polish theater is very much director driven, um, at least recently. But the 1968 Jade, even though it was produced, uh, you know, it, it was even though it was staged by one of the best direct, uh, theater directors of the time, nonetheless stuck to Mitskevich's Forefathers Eve Part Three, um, and there are, you know, very strong anti-Russian uh, 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 moments in the play, particularly in the beginning, you know, when Conrad is shaking his uh, shackles to the uh, Soviet delegation that's sitting in the front row, right, and who get very upset, and this is why the thing was taken off stage. This new one, and I haven't seen it, so I don't know, but what I've read about it, it's not simply a staging of Forefathers Eve Part Three, or even making Conrad um, a disabled woman uh, playing the, but it's a, how should one put it, a revision of 
the play itself and hence of romanticism and hence in this way a implied, not even maybe really an explicit critique of Mitskevich's romanticism as well. So uh, it is, a, it works in two two directions. On the one hand, it, it addresses cont various contemporary issues that it, such as uh, uh, the pedophilia scandals in, ch in the church and the women's, women's problem, the anti-abortion uh, 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 policies of uh, the uh, current uh, government. On the one hand, in other words, actualizing it, making it relevant in that respect. But at the same time, it also seems to be a critique of the romantic cult in Poland, the cult of and which Mitskevich in many ways represents or embodies too. So uh, it's, I think, it'll be interesting. I'd love to see. Well, I don't know whether I'd love to, love to see it. I don't know, but uh, it it has that double edged um, uh, effect. Well, that it points to like the uses of Mitskevich, right? I mean that uh, that uh, on the one hand, there's you know, I mean we going back to the start of our conversation, right? I mean, we we're talking about how uh, Mitskevich was in his own day, a kind of you know, significant European intellectual that uh, he used his Russian connections to make his way into, uh, into other circles. Um, and, uh, but in your, you know, in your biography, you talk about how, um, how the, you know, the, you know, he's, he becomes nationalized essentially after his death. Um, and now maybe what we're getting is, is we're getting uh, the two, Mits, two Mitskeviches at war with each other uh, right. in, you know, in, in this, in this play. Um, well, you know, you know he, he becomes nationalized even earlier. I mean, his own work beginning at, you know, with the uh, uh, 1830 uprising and his subsequent guilt about not, participating in the uprising itself and his attempt to atone for this uh, 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 inability to participate, which he essentially devotes his entire, the re remainder of his life, atoning for uh, his failure to join the uprising, narrows his uh, purview as a European writer. He becomes a Polish writer. And as great as Pantadeusz is, as great as Forefathers Eve Part Three is for Poles, it says that they need, neither of these two works speak to something out with the culture, out with Polish culture. Uh, and in many ways, I see this as a kind of a tragedy of Mitskevich because he really could have, if things had turned out, you know, there were no uprising and all that, who knows? He could have been one of the great European talents of his generation. He certainly had it in him. And if you look at something like Pantadeusz or Forefathers Eve Part Three, these are remarkable works of literature, except they do not speak to a non-Polish or they don't resonate the way they do with the Polish audience. And uh, uh, I kind of, you know, I mean, uh, well, it's just the way it is. <laughs> Maybe they will someday. I mean, you know, that's that's why we're doing what we're doing, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> that's why I'm hope, doing what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> One might hope, but I, I, I have my doubts. I don't know. Uh, certainly not Forefathers Eve Part 3. Uh, and Miłosz already a long time ago pointed this out, you know, when he looked into, you know, I think he was in his in the library somewhere in Berkeley, and he saw some student had written uh, <laughs> a note about, you know, Poland suffering and so forth, and somebody had written, good for them, they deserve it, you know, or something <laughs> to that effect. <laughs> oh, wow. And, uh, uh, Pantadeusz, on the other hand, may in some ways, ostensibly could speak to uh, something wider. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a great work of art, but Forefathers Eve Part Three, it's, you know, hypertrophied romanticism. It's, uh, 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 the, you know, the whole notion of Poland as Christ of nations, all of these things. I don't think that that goes over too well in <laughs> a non Polish audience. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, on that note, um, uh, for those who, who are ambitious enough to, uh, to take on uh, Mitskiewicz, uh, if they were interested in uh, studying uh, Polish literature at uh, UCLA, uh, what can uh, what would you have to offer them? Me, <laughs> you, and the department. Me and the department. The department is undergoing a, a, a 
bit of a transition now. It's shrunken radically from what it used to be. Uh, however, uh, we are making an effort to build a department at the moment uh, and uh, to, 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 uh, to do as much as we can within the confines of what the university allows us to do, right? Which means giving us or not giving us FTEs, right, that we mm -hmm. need and for which we beg all the time. But if anybody wants to study Polish literature, uh, I'm here for you. And uh, I'm, I've produced, this is, I think, more, um, this is something I'm more, I, my, a greater achievement than anything that I've written is the fact that I've managed to inter, inter, interest so many graduate students uh, who had come to the department to study Russian literature to manage to interest them in Polish literature and have them go on some like Boris Troluk go on and be translators of Polish things. Uh, and I have a number of other graduate students who've already written on Polish topics. And uh, that's what I have to offer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good thing. So thanks so much for being uh, on the program today was... and, uh, and uh, presenting, uh, presenting your ideas about Mickiewicz. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. And you're very, very welcome. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to receive notifications about new videos from the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Go to the Polish Cultural Institute's website linked in the description to see a full schedule of upcoming episodes. I'd like to thank all the people who make this series possible. Our sponsor, the Polish Cultural Institute New York, is directed by Robert Czaniawski. Bartek Remisko, head of humanities and literature at the Polish Cultural Institute, New York, suggested this series and acts as our executive producer. My fellow producer, Natalia Iudin, handles all the video editing, technical, and aesthetic aspects of this production. Claudia Ofwana Draber, head of communications at the Polish Cultural Institute, New York, keeps us all informed about upcoming episodes of Encounters with Polish Literature and other events organized by the Polish Cultural Institute, New York. Thank you all for listening and reading along with us. Let's meet again in a month when we'll be talking about 20th century poet and memoirist Aleksander Vat with Professor Michał Paweł Markowski, one of Poland's most productive literary theorists and the Stefan and Lucy Heyna Family Chair in Polish Language and Literature at the University of Illinois at Chicago. See you then.